Okay, so now we really get into some anatomy while we start to examine the skeletal system. In this chapter, you'll want to spend a lot of time in anatomy and physiology revealed, looking at these actual bones and structures. We'll spend time in lab also looking at Hank, our skeleton. But it's going to be imperative that you put together a really good outline of all these different structures. You'll be held responsible for all the structures that are listed in the text of this chapter. I'll highlight them as we go through. We'll begin by taking an overview of the skeleton. The skull is our first endeavor. The skull is very complicated and it can certainly feel really overwhelming, but I want to caution you to just breathe and take some time. We're going to learn a lot of different features in the skull. Then when we move into the vertebral column and thoracic cage, things will become a little bit less overwhelming. The pectoral girdle and the upper limbs, and then we'll look at the pelvic girdle and lower limbs. After the skull, those should seem pretty simple. Now we're going to be learning a lot of different features on the bones, not only the names of the bones. And these features are really important because they're acting as sites for muscle attachments, and they'll help you understand how the muscles attach and have their actions on each of the joints when we get to that chapter. So the skeleton in general is divided into two regions, the axial and appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is exactly as it sounds. It forms the central supporting axis of the body, so it includes the skull, which contains auditory ossicles, little bones, as well as the hyoid bone right in the throat, and the vertebral column and thoracic cage. And the thoracic cage includes the ribs and sternum. The appendicular skeleton is just like it sounds, too. It's the appendages. It includes the bones of the upper limb and the pectoral girdle, which is the girdle that suspends the upper limb, and the bones of the lower limb and the pelvic girdle around the pelvis. There are 206 bones in a typical adult skeleton. And it varies slightly because there are some sesamoid bones, like the patella, that form within some tendons in response to stresses. So some people have a few additional bones. It also varies with the presence of sutural bones or wormian bones in the skull. These are extra bones that develop in the skull suture lines. They're really tiny and barely noticeable. At birth, children have 270 bones. However, a lot of these bones fuse together to form the adult skeleton. So the number decreases to 206. Whew, thank goodness. Now, as I said, there's many surface markings on bones that we're going to be held accountable for. There are ridges and spines and bumps and depressions. There are canals, pores, slits, cavities, and all sorts of articular surfaces. Here's a look at the appendicular and axial skeleton. You can see the axial skeleton highlighted in more of a yellow color here. And you can see the appendicular skeleton is highlighted in green. Now, as for some of these anatomical features of bones, some of the language that we need to get used to, you'll see here in Table 7.2 in your text. You'll notice that there are many different names, for example, for openings. Foramen will always mean hole. Canal or meatus will always mean tunnel. Fissure is a cleft. A sinus or a labyrinth is an empty cavity usually within a bone. If you become familiar with some of these words, then you'll understand which portion of the bone you're looking at. It's sort of like learning another language. Again, look at depressions. There are a number of different things for depressions. Fossa, notch, fovea, groove or sulcus. And their usage is fairly consistent. So spend a little time and become familiar with this table. This figure also helps you understand some of those terminologies. So let's begin with the skull. 
the skull is certainly the most complex part of the skeleton, so it can be a little overwhelming to start here. But imagine, once you've got the skull under control, the rest of it should be easy. The skull is composed of 22 different bones, and they're joined by sutures, which are immovable joints. There are eight cranial bones that surround the cranial cavity and enclose the brain, and there are 14 facial bones that support the teeth. So those are the first two divisions of your outline. The skull, eight bones of which are the cranial bones, and 14 are in another category called facial bones. There are lots of different cavities in the skulls, like the orbits where the eyes go, the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the middle and inner ear cavity, as well as all the paranasal sinuses. There are a number of different paranasal sinuses, the frontal sinuses, the sphenoid sinuses, ethmoid and maxillary sinuses. Each of these sinuses are lined by mucous membranes and are air-filled, unless, of course, you have a sinus infection and they might be filled with snot. <laughs> they lighten the anterior portion of the skull and act as chambers that'll add resonance to the voice. Now, there are a lot of foramina in the skull. So not cavities, but foramina, remember, means holes. Most of these holes allow passage for either nerves, blood vessels, or both. You may have another category in your outline that's just for foramina, so you can whip through the skull and name all the different holes in it. Now, when we look at the cranium itself, it has a number of different fossa inside. Hmm. What did fossa mean again? Let's take a look at that table. A fossa is a general term for a depression. So three major fossa in the skull. There's the anterior cranial fossa, which hold, holds the frontal lobe of the brain, you can see here. The middle crania fossa holds the temporal lobes of the brain, you can see those here. And the posterior cranial fossa contains the cerebellum. The brain case itself, these eight bones, is there to protect the brain and the associated sense organs. If the brain swells inside this rigid cranium, it may force tissue through this foramen magnum, which is a very large hole, foramen, hole, magnum, very big. And that can result in death. So swelling of the brain is very, very dangerous. The cranium consists of two major parts. The calvaria, which is the skull cap, and the cranial portion, which is this base where we just examined the different fossae. So let's begin by looking at the first of the eight cranial bones. So we've got our heading of skull, our subheading of cranial bones, and here we are with the frontal bone. The frontal bone forms the forehead and part of the roof of the cranium. It's the piece in orange here. It's bordered by the coronal suture on the posterior side. The supraorbital margin forms the roof of the orbit right here. And the supraorbital foramen, you can see a tiny little hole there, provides a passage for a nerve, artery, and a vein. The glabella is the smooth area above the root of the nose, you can see right here. And it contains the frontal sinus. So those are some structures to put in your outline. Why not start now? Next, we'll look at the parietal bone. The parietal bone is shown here in pink. It forms most of the cranial roux and part of the lateral walls. There are two parietal bones, one on each side. There are four sutures that surround the parietal bone. The sagittal, which is the one that's between the parietal bones, down the middle of the top of the head. The corona at the anterior margin, 
here between the frontal and both parietal bones. The lambdoid suture is the one we see on the posterior margin of the parietal bone between the pink and the green. And the squamous we see at the lateral border between the parietal and temporal bone. We'll also see two temporal lines. These two temporal lines serve as attachment sites for the temporalis muscle, which sits right here and goes through the zygomatic arch and acts to open and close, predominantly close, the jaw. It's one of the strongest muscles in our body. Next, the temporal bone. The temporal bone is shown here in purple. It forms the lateral wall and part of the floor of the cranial cavity. It has three parts, the squamous part, the tympanic part, and the mastoid part. You'll want to be familiar with each of these particular parts. The squamous part is encircled by the squamous suture right here. The tympanic part is where we see all the auditory meatus and the styloid process right here. And the mastoid part is where we see the mastoid process. It's this port posterior portion right back here. We also see the mastoid notch, the stylomastoid foramen, a hole, and the mastoid foramen. However, they can't be seen very easily from this view. So let's take a look from a different perspective. We're still in purple looking at the temporal bone. Inside, we'll see the petrous part. The petrous part of the temporal bone is this ridge right here on the inside. It separates the middle from the posterior cranial fossa, and it houses the middle and inner ear cavities. In here, we have receptors for hearing as well as a sense of balance. You can see also the internal acoustic or internal auditory meatus. This is the opening for cranial nerve 7, which is a vestibulocochlear nerve. You'll also see the carotid canal and the jugular foramen. In this picture, the jugular foramen is much easier to see. We really need a three-dimensional skull to move around and find these various holes. And by all means, investigate each of these features in Anatomy and Physiology Revealed. There's some really great images in there. Here's another view of the temporal bone. We can look at the outside surface of it, and we can look at the inside surface of it. The styloid process is a pretty prominent feature. We can also see the mastoid process. So mastoid process, styloid process, the mastoid notch, and the mandibular fossa. Our next cranial bone is the occipital bone. It's at the rear and base of the skull. There's some big features on the occipital bone that we need to know also. First of all, the foramen magnum is a great landmark. It's the hole that the spinal cord passes through. Anterior to the foramen magnum, we see the basilar part of the occipital bone. Basilar skull fractures are very, very dangerous. We'll also see that the we'll also see on the base of the skull the occipital condyles. These are the articular surfaces that interact with the very top of the spinal cord, the atlas vertebrae. We can also see on the occipital bone the hypoglossal canal. It's better seen from this picture. It just enters, it exits the spinal cord right here and transmits the hypoglossal nerve, which supplies many of the tongue muscles. We'll also see the condylar canal right here, as well as the external occipital protuberance. You can feel this on the back of your own skull. 
This is where the nuchal ligament attaches and prevents our head from just bobbing forward. There's also a superior and inferior nuchal lines as big landmarks on the occipital bone. The superior nuchal line and inferior nuchal line. This is where many of the muscles of the neck attach. The sphenoid bone is the keystone to the skull. Every single other bone contacts the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid has a body. When we look at it here, dissected out, the body is in the middle. We'll also see that there's a greater wing and a lesser wing. We'll see the optic foramen or the foramen rotundum the anterior clinoid process, and the superior orbital fissure, which goes right into the back of the orbits. Let's take a different view. Here is the anterior clinoid process. Here's another view of the foramen rotundum. Here's another view of the foramen rotundum from the other side. You can see the posterior nasal apertures that lead into the back of the nose. On this figure, we can see the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. Each plate has a narrow inferior extension called a pterygoid process. So there's four pterygoid processes. And within the sphenoid bone, we'll see the sphenoid sinus. One more big feature on the sphenoid bone is the cella tersica, or Turkish saddle. This is a big indentation where the pituitary gland sits. So the sphenoid bone is a very complicated bone, but I invite you here to go look in Anatomy and Physiology Revealed and identify all the different features of the sphenoid bone. Take your outline and make sure that you're finding all the ones that have been covered in this lecture. And now let's take a look at the ethmoid bone. It's a difficult bone to talk about because it's pretty small. The ethmoid bone is right between the eyes. You can see it here by looking right inside the orbit. It's much easier to talk about when we separate the bone out from the skull, though. You'll notice you can't see the ethmoid bone from this view into the skull, except for where it pokes up through and gives you the crista galli, which is the chicken's comb, and the cribiform foramina, little tiny holes that are in this plate called the cribiform plate. So here you see that again the cribriform plate right here, full of tiny little holes. These tiny little holes take the nerves that are receiving the sense of smell up into the olfactory nerves. The cristagalli is this little piece here, otherwise known as the chicken's comb. The perpendicular plate forms the superior two-thirds of the nasal septum. The rest is formed by some facial bones. This labyrinth in here is a largest mass on either side of the perpendicular plate. In there are ethmoid cells. These are air spaces that make up the ethmoid sinuses. We'll also see the orbital plate. This is the part that we see inside the orbit right here. You can see the arrangement of the ethmoid bone inside the skull and how it relates to the nose right here. We can see the ethmoid bone, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The rest of the division will be again formed by vomer, which is one of the facial bones. So that completes our tour of the eight cranial bones. Go to APR right now and look for all of these features. Put together your outline of all the features that you need to know for the cranial bone before we even move on to the cranial bones in the next section.